Good evening. Welcome to our Thursday night Bible study. I see Bert and Shirley are there and Kayla Street. Glad that you're with us tonight. Looking forward to our study. Uh, we're looking at the Book of Romans tonight on a hot, muggy, truly in Evansville um, coming up on July 4th weekend. Really feels like Evansville right now with this hot, muggy weather. We'll uh, get started in just a moment. Just uh, got about three minutes. Robin and Elaine Daniels with us. Good to have them joining us tonight. Butch and Kitty Keister. I had a feeling maybe, uh, well, I don't know how many will show up, but such a hot day. I wondered if people uh, wouldn't be outside right now. Fred and Becky joining us as well. Again, we're in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans, of course, is an epistle or a letter of Paul. And in the uh, church year readings, there's been some continuous readings in Romans. And I thought this Sunday we would pick up with those continuous readings. This Sunday, it's Romans 5. Next Sunday, it's Romans 6. And then the next Sunday is Romans um, seven. The lectionary I'm following is about one week off. Good evening from Donna and John. Good to have them with us. About one week off from the common lectionary. This is one that uh, was put together, a variation on it by the Wisconsin Lutherans, and I just kind of like some of how the readings are. But Romans 5, and this is really a pivotal chapter and a very challenging one, but also a very comforting one, as I think we'll uh, discover tonight as we're looking at the book of Romans tonight. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, any announcements I need to make uh, this evening. We are going to try to have the outdoor service, Lord willing, if there's no rain. And I have Margie and Eldon. Good to have them with us. Margie and Eldon joining us. Um, I've talked to people who said they've been wanting to come, they've been planning to come to the outdoor service, uh, the possibility of being able to sit outside. And again, that will be at eight o'clock. Deanne Johnson says hello. And um, we'll open the doors. You can sit under the trees back there. It's it's shaded. Sharon and Alan, uh, good to have them with us. Uh, Alan's recovering from a procedure, a successful one on his back. I want to continue to pray for him as they're um, looking at therapy and things like that for him. Uh, and actually, I'm using one of the commentaries that um, Alan's been blessing me with the set. You can see up at the top there, the green on the top. This is a set of commentaries Alan has given me, the Reformation commentary on Scripture. And you see this is Romans 1 through 8. And um, some of what I'm going to share with you today, quotes, comes from that commentary. I really enjoy those commentaries. Paul and Lou Ann are watching. So as I was saying, the 8 o'clock service, it's an opportunity. If you want to come, you can just even, if it's not raining, you can, you can park. We're going to put the uh, speaker outside. You can park away from everybody else. You could just get out of your car, sit right by your car far away, if you'd like, in the open air. And everything I've been hearing as far as virus concerns is that, you know, if you're in the open air and you're far away from people, you're, I think, pretty safe. And uh, But it would be giving you an opportunity to see people and um, to join with people. And again, I know singing is a concern, and definitely when you're outside, uh, you'll be, you could be separated in that way. I do want to also say, uh, if you have kids or you know of anyone with kids, it'd be a great opportunity to try out the... Um, the really nice, refurbished, up-to-date looking playgrounds. Really, really, uh, really, really looks nice. So that's this, um, that's this coming Sunday again, if we don't have rain, and we'll, we'll try to do this, you know, throughout the summer. We've really been working on it um, even this week uh, to and continue to improve that service, which has been going well. Betty Kriedemeyer. Janet is watching question mark. But Janet, you're the one who wrote that, so you must 
you must know that you're watching. I, I bet you hit that on accident. But good to have you with us, Janet. And Betty. Anna Combs West, my mother-in-law is watching. Good to have you with us, Anna. So we're in Romans. A letter of Paul. Before this thing all happened, yeah, yeah. Before this thing all happened, we were studying Romans at Wednesdays for our um, Wednesday Bible study. So we already got some background in it, but I'll go over just a little bit of the background. And then we'll look at this really fascinating and difficult passage. You know, part of what, as you're looking to preach every Sunday, Part of what draws me to a passage is if I find that it's something that I believe I could learn a lot from. Not that I couldn't learn a lot from every passage, but if it's something that really interests me, then I'll know I'll be really motivated to study it. And this is one of those passages that is one of those ones that's really challenging and motivated me to really study it. Again, I won't go into too much detail about prayer concerns, although I did mention Alan. We want to continue to pray for Alan. But just because of the public nature of these videos, we'll kind of keep um, things to a minimum. But we'll just lift up all the needs that we have on our, our prayer list as we begin praying on this coming up 4th of July weekend. So we'll definitely want to pray for our country. I know it's been on a lot of people's hearts and minds. As even Marlon Beck texted me Sunday just before the service to be praying for our country. I know other people are thinking about that as well. So we'll pray with that especially in mind. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this upcoming uh, obs observance of the birth of our country, that we live in a land that is free and that we have the freedom like this, freedom of conscience to study your word, to live our lives in accordance with your word. And we are grateful for the freedom of religion that we know in this country. And we recognize that it's a great miracle for down through the centuries, this has not been the norm. And even today, there are countries where people are persecuted for their faith. And I just read again of the terrible persecutions going on in Africa, in some places of Africa, of Christians, and persecutions in China. And we know of persecutions in North Korea and, and parts of the Middle East, where it's not even legal to have a church. And we rejoice, Lord, that we have such great freedom here to, to worship. But thank you for the other freedoms we have, the freedom of speech, to be able to, to speak our minds and, and in the speaking, work things out too. It's a way of being able to have freedom of speech allows growth and development and the challenge of, of various ideas. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to preserve these liberties and um, all the other things that we're so grateful for with this country, uh, the blessings of the uh, prosperity that we've known and the opportunities to develop and grow and maximize the gifts, even as you commanded in Genesis, that we be fruitful. Thank you that this is a place where we're able to do that. But we are in a time, Lord, when we're very concerned about our country's direction. And we have an upcoming election. We have decisions being made in cities and by governors. We have the challenge of this virus, all these various things. And we just bring all of those concerns to you right now, Lord. And we, we cast those cares upon you because you care for us. And we pray for our land. Uh, so much is out of our control. We can vote. We can get involved in our local community. We can be involved in our churches, but uh, at a, a macro level, there's a lot that we can't, we can't control. But we thank you that we can pray. And that, as the Old Testament says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And uh, ultimately, we can put our trust in there's one greater than the king, greater than the governmental authorities. I do thank you for Alan's successful procedure and that he's joining us tonight. And we just pray, Lord, for his future treatment, what he has um, uh, as far as future, where, where he should be and what he should be doing. 
do lift up to the people. We know with the virus, some are aware that there are people in our um, community that people are aware of that have, have the virus. We pray, Lord, for their healing and total recovery. And um, they're in more in the city of Evansville where I'm aware of some of this. But we just pray, Father, for their uh, total and complete recovery. But we ask right now for your blessing on this study of such an important uh, doctrinal text to help us to see the doctrine it's really pointing to, the one it's really emphasizing. And uh, may we be encouraged once more by the truth of the gospel. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're on the book of Romans. I just want to talk a little bit um, about Romans and share um, some of the background to it by looking at a few illustrations. Again, I want to use uh, a really good uh, slide from the Open Bible that gives such a good overview of each of these books. This is from the Open Bible. You see there where it has the reference, that's the various chapters the book divides into from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 16. And at the top, they give three different focus, foci, you might say, uh, the focuses of the, of the book. One, the revelation of God's righteousness is a good summary of that opening chapters all the way up to chapter 9. Vindication of God's righteousness, 9 through 12, and then application. That very last is really an application to the, the local church of how they're to receive this, but of God's being in the right, but also of the rightness that he gives to us. And then you can see under that first section, we're going to be in chapter 5 today, so we're in that section of the revelation of God's righteousness, that the opening chapters, 1 through 3, really show uh, our need for God's righteousness. And it culminates in chapter 3 with some famous verses we're pretty much aware of. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and, it, and, it, and it shows that we all have a need for the righteousness that God can give us. Then chapter 3, uh, the second last part of chapter 3, through chapter 6, it shows how God's righteousness is imputed or given to us as a gift. And that's salvation. You see the topic underneath. So the first topic is sin, showing the need that we're all sinners. Second topic is salvation, that what God did by sending his son Jesus while we were yet sinners. It's going to say in chapter 5, just before our reading for Sunday, uh, Christ died for us. Then chapter 6, that will be next Sunday's uh, chapter, is about the new life. That's what sanctification is, the demonstration of the new life. And uh, I won't go into all the rest there. Let's focus on that first part, because that will be our what we're thinking about tonight. You know, so they say it's probably written in Corinth around A.D. 57. And uh, if you remember, Paul goes on missionary journeys. Here is a map of uh, Paul's missionary journeys. And on his third missionary journey, which here is in red, you can see, where he starts up there in the red over on the the um, left-hand side from Antioch of Syria. That was, again, we said a few, maybe it was last week, that that was a, an early center of Christianity. Remember the book of Acts says they were first called Christians at Antioch. And Paul had had some ministry in Antioch earlier with Barnabas. And this was a mixed, you know, this was this was in Syria, so it's north of Israel. It's a Gentile city where there's a lot of Jews, however, and there's a great expansion of Christi Christianity there at Antioch. And you notice how he goes from Antioch up into Cilicia, and this is the area that's now Turkey, up to Asia Minor. Then he goes up into Macedonia, and then down uh, into um, I forget how you say it, but this what's Greece now, Achaia or something like that. I forget. I ha I looked up the pronunciation and I'm getting it wrong again. But there is Athens and uh, there's Corinth, and that, it was while he was there at Corinth on this journey 
right there below Macedonia in that area of um, what's Greece today, that he most likely wrote this letter. Part of his motivation for writing it is he was hoping, praying, and, and, and desiring to um, go to Rome. Now, here we see on this map Rome up in that uh, upper um, left-hand corner. I guess I got my left and right mixed up on the last slide. But he's up there in that top part where it says Rome. And he's uh, really what, what seems to be his desire, and this is spoken of in places, that he wants to go all the way up to Spain. And he's wanting Rome to be kind of a base from which he can, he can really spread the gospel beyond that part of the world and go up north. And um, he's writing to Rome, a church that he's never visited, but of course what we'll find out is in the back of the letter when he's addressing and greeting people that he knows many people that are there. We'll talk about um, for a moment how it is that he probably knew people in Rome. A little bit of the background there. But looking at a timeline of, of Romans, of Paul's life there. His conversion is around 33, 34 AD, not long after the resurrection of Jesus. And then um, he's in Corinth in AD 57, and he writes the Romans. And then he's martyred in Rome, where he is beheaded, somewhere between 64 to 67 AD, which is the time of uh, Emperor Nero. Wasn't it 64? I'm pretty positive was the burning of Rome, where uh, Nero will blame the Christians for that. So that's a little bit of the background, but um, a really good study Bible, again, I've mentioned this before, is the um, Cultural Background Study Bible. And this gives a little bit of history, the Cultural Background Study Bible, into Rome. Against some lower estimates, Rome's population was close to a million people. By far the largest city of Mediterranean antiquity. This massive population was sustained by a regular brain dole and heavy imports that included more than 200,000 tons, that's 180,000 metric tons of grain each year. So it's a big place. now. Again, now they have an emperor. I've been watching this course on the history of Rome where it moves from being a republic then to being the Roman Empire where you have these Caesars from Julius Caesar and then Augustus, you know, and, and on. And this is the time, it's not long before Jesus where all that intrigue and the breakdown in Roman society was happening. It's fascinating to study that history of Rome because before uh, the breakup of the Republic, you know, it's when they begin to start using violence against each other. Many of the, the leaders, <coughs> the leaders of the, uh, the politicians and people are assassinating people. And, and you can see how they're, they really degenerate as a people. And then it goes from being in the Roman Republic being uh, the Roman Empire and having uh, Caesars and things like that. And that's the period we're in here. There was an estimated 40 to 50,000 Jews. So out of a million people, there were 40 to 50,000 Jews. Some of these were Roman citizens. Most descended from slaves freed more than a century earlier. So about 100 years prior to this, so they've been there a century. Think about that, the long periods of time. Greek was the primary language of Rome's Jewish community. Another resource I read said, you know, looking at their um, tombstone type stuff where they marked things, uh, they used mostly G Greek language. And so it makes sense then again that Paul writes Romans, not even though he's writing to Rome, not in Latin but he writes it in Greek. The majority were poor and many worked on the docks by the Tiber River. Uh, sources from the period show that Romans ridiculed some Jewish customs, especially circumcision, Sabbath, and the food laws. 
I could really see that, you know, I, in the study of Rome, one of the things I found out is that the Romans really liked pork. You could tell when Roman uh, when they do archaeological digs, when it became occupied by the Romans, is you have this uptick in the find of um, pig bones, and so that would really, uh, if that's one of your favorite foods, uh, that would really stand out to you. Um, many other Romans were attracted, however, to Judaism, but the conversion of Roman women often provoked aristocratic men to criticize Judaism more harshly. Um, one of the things that happened is that there were a bunch of little synagogues here, which was different than in Alexandria, Egypt. In Alexandria, Egypt, you had one unified Jewish community with one overall leader who spoke for them, but in order to please the Romans, they had to have really a decentralized power. And this allowed for a lot of evangelism because you had these separate communities to go to. But here's what happens. This is kind of the background to this letter. In the wake of one scandal reportedly involving a Jewish, a single Jewish swindler, just one Jewish swindler, the emperor Tiberius, between 42 and 37 AD, expelled all the Jews from Rome. Now they say probably not all the Jews left, but they were expelled then. Then around 49 AD, which is getting close to the time we're looking at, the Emperor Claudius did the same thing. So twice we know that the Jews were kicked out, technically. Not everyone left. You know, one of the amazing things is is that even in Germany, during the time of Nazi Germany, there were several thousand Jews still living in their midst in Berlin, which is just uh, weird to think, how could that be? But in the same way, you had these Jews who were there uh, in, in Rome. Because Claudius's expulsion, the second one, is believed to have been in response to Jewish divisions about the Messiah. In fact, I can't remember which historian mentions that there was a argument about one named Christus. And so it seems like they were arguing about Christ, probably people who didn't believe in Christ and with other Jews who did. It seems likely that Jewish followers of Jesus were involved. This may explain why Aquila and Priscilla were among those compelled to leave, as Acts 18 says. Many scholars believe that Gentiles Christians went their separate way from the synagogue after this, accounting for the limited information about them that we have. Well, in AD 54, just three years before Paul would have written this letter, so just three years, Claudius dies, that emperor who had kicked them out, and they're able to go back, the Jews. So this is how Paul has knows personally many of the people in the, at the end of the letter is because these are people who would have been having to leave, and so they were they were at places where they would have seen Paul, and then they go back. Um, and then it says in AD 64, as I said, a fire destroyed much of Rome with its narrow alleys and many flimsy wooden structures, and um, Nero is the one who blamed the Christians. And it was around that time that Paul was beheaded. Well, this is the background. Um, and it partly explains how the letter begins. Paul begins in Romans 1 by showing that all, uh, especially Gentiles, are sinners. But then in chapter 2, he says, who are you who judge? You do the same thing, speaking to Jews. So some have felt that there were tensions with those Jews who came back because the Gentiles had been used to living not following any of the Jewish rules, that they were free in Christ not to follow those rules. And from what we gather, part of the end of the letter, as Paul says, you know, one, he says, one um, esteems one day above another, and another person doesn't. Let each person be convinced in his own mind. He seems to be addressing a situation where these Jews have come back, and um, they're they're causing conflicts because they want to live more like a Jewish person, and no doubt they were they were saying to these Gentiles, you know, you, you should really live like us and be following the rules that we're following. And 
Part of the letter is for Paul to show them how everything has been fulfilled in Jesus and to ground them in when he gives his explanation at the end of how they should be living. And here's the most detailed explanation of the faith that he gives. And the part we're going to get up on today is a part where that has played a big role in Christian belief and especially Protestant belief because it's here that we, we come across the doctrine of original sin. But as we're going to see, that's really not the main thing Paul's talking about. And if that's what we focus on solely, we'll really have missed the beautiful part of this, this passage, Romans 5, 12 and following, because his goal really isn't so much to show us what has happened to us because of Adam, because of our being caught up in Adam, the the human human condition. Um, what he wants to show us is what has happened because of Christ. And he's using Adam, Adam, which Adam, I'm saying that in that Hebrew way, literally means man, mankind. And so to be in Adam isn't to be in this, is, is to be in this person, Adam, but that, that person, Adam, stands for the human condition. So he's going to explain the human condition. And this, I think, is so interesting and so important and, and fits for the time in which we live because I, um, I follow different preachers on Twitter and one pointed out that uh, there was an op-ed piece in the um, New York Times talking about Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. And, you know, it's about this whole statue thing that's going on, pulling down the statues. And this, this opinion piece was saying, well, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a mixture of good and bad. And this uh, preacher, you know, or a pastor on Twitter was saying, yeah, that's the human condition. And we do get a sense that some of this purity thing that's going on. Now, I'm not saying I'm not going to try to get into arguing you know, the validity of changing names of things and that, there there may be, um, you know, a, a balanced approach to this. I'm, I don't want to get into arguing that. That's something I think Christians can argue about. You know, should you remove Woodrow Wilson, for example, given the kind of beliefs Woodrow Wilson had, his name as it has been done from places. But there's there's this idea almost now that if a person has a mixed legacy, they're imperfect in some way. I saw even the University of Wisconsin Madison. There is a group wanting to remove a big uh, statue of Abraham Lincoln because Abraham Lincoln was involved in the, the largest mass execution of American Indians, Native Americans, and uh, he was involved also in giving a lot of land that belonged to uh, Indians to white people and. Uh, that's even there. The chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Madison said, "Now wait a minute here, you know," and and resisted that, saying that so much of what he did, out, you know, when you weigh it in the balance, and especially for his time, he he did so many great things. But you're just getting a sense that perhaps in our world, that's become uh, for a lot of people more secular. They're disconnected from a lot of assumed truths. A big assumed truth that our country's founded on as we're thinking about the 4th of July is that no person should be trusted with a lot of power, right? So that we have this, this um, checks and balances. And there, there's a lot of power in the executive branch, but even then you have this ability to impeach, you have the ability to remove and... Um, the assumed view of human nature, whether it's explicitly mentioned or not in the Constitution, is that human beings are all a mixed bag and uh, easily tempted and can go astray and are caught up in this thing called sin. And a great exponent of the doctrine we're going to look at tonight, original sin, Reinhold Niebuhr, said about democracy, democracy is possible because of man's ability for justice. That is, we have this ability to uh, you know, set up the system that we have, 
but democracy is necessary because of man's ability or um, man's propensity to injustice. And there is that great mix here. And that's where we're getting to in Romans 5, chapter 12, this, this picture of the condition of human beings. Starting in Romans 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. Now, the important thing is, is he's saying just as this happened. And so you see that that's not, this is not the topic, the main topic for Paul. The main topic for Paul is the just as, the something that's just like the spread of sin from one man, which is for him going to be the spread of righteousness from one man. What really matters to Paul is he's not someone, he's not, he's not like fire and brimstone preachers who want to just dwell on how bad we are. He brings it up, but, but the thing that really strikes him and what is really important to him is um, what, what God has done for us in Christ. I like what one of the commentaries I studied for this said. This is the Romans commentary from, Mar uh, from Martin Franzman. He said, um, why does Paul labor so m to mark the plus side of God and Christ? That is, if you really read Romans, he is marking the plus side. He's not on the negative side. That's, at the beginning, it seems like that, but he's getting it all ready so he can really emphasize the plus side. To judge from the whole of Paul's writings, one motive was to give God his glory. Paul would have no shadow fall upon the face of him who shined in his heart with the light of his new creation. And then I, I highlighted this because I thought it was so good. To proclaim his wrath, meaning God, and his love as evenly balanced and equal potencies in him would be to blaspheme him. They're not equal, his wrath and his love. They're not equal potencies. That's a distortion. It's a distorted view of God. I, I've been saying, you know, we sang a Trinity Sunday. Though the eye of sinful man, thy glory may not see. That is when you're a sinner, and if the glory of God is the person of Christ, and we all fall short of the glory of God, which is the person of Christ and his love, that's the glory of God, not his power, because we're not called to emulate God in his power. To fall short of his glory is not to fall short of having his power or to fall short of having his all-knowingness or to having his all-wisdom. To fall short of the glory of God is to not live in the way of love, as Romans 1 through 3 is showing. And it ends with, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God because we all do the things Romans 1 talks about. We all do these unloving things. So God's glory is his love. John can say, this is that commentary, that God is love. And Paul and all the prophets and apostles say amen to that. But neither John nor Paul nor any man in whom God's Spirit work, works would dare to say that God's wrath, God is wrath. They would never do that because that would be to blaspheme God. The truth about God, the face of God is love. And that's why one of the things I love about Luther saying is, if all you see is the wrath, then all you are seeing is the wrong side of God. But the eye of sinful man can't see that God is love because, because they feel the wrath because of their sinfulness. And that's why it takes God coming in the person of Jesus and going on to the cross where the wrath is poured out on him. And at that same moment when we're seeing God in his wrath, we're seeing, oh, but God is love. And I've been, I haven't been able to see that because of my feeling in my being that I'm at odds with God. And that's what this passage begins with, talking about why that is that I feel in my being at odds with God and why that's the human situation. He says, sin entered the world and death through sin, and it came to all people because all sinned. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about that. There's a, a train of thought that's saying that we all sinned in Adam. So. Um, so that, and there, that's a very prestigious train of thought or uh, an interpretation of that, that that is often used to say, that's the meaning here, 
that death came to all people, verse 12, because all sinned in that act of Adam's sin. But the, the, the Greek word is a two different uses of that word. And in his commentary, the word biblical commentary, James Dunn says, the use of the two different forms of the word sin shows that, first of all, sin entering the world, that's one form. And then all sinned is to say one has to do with with the universal uh, thing that happened. And this all sinned has to do with the individual action, the individual's sins. So that Paul will say, all have sinned in Romans 3.23. And this is an echo of that. So that death entered the world, it came to, uh, into the world because all people individually sinned. Not because, now this is controversial in a way, and yet not one of the great reformers of the church held the view I'm going to hold here. And his name was John Calvin. And I was, as I was studying for this, John Calvin was a reformer around the time of Martin Luther. And um, he died in like 1564. He only lived to the age 54, which really is interesting to me. In fact, I think I have an illustration, a picture of uh, Calvin. But here, let's see here. And so now that I'm 52, 54 seems rather young. And, uh, and to think of what this man accomplished, a lot of people associate negative things with Calvin. Uh, because he's so associated with predestination. But if you actually read his writings, uh, he was a much more pastoral, and um, I just, I really enjoy uh, Calvin uh, in a lot of ways and um, am, am thankful for him. But he says, there are indeed some, this is from his commentaries. I looked at both, I first studied his commentaries, and then I went and looked at his theology book called the Institutes of the Christian Religion, and he teaches it in both places. There are indeed some who contend that we are so lost through Adam's sin as though we perished through no fault of our own. There are those who say, with the fall of Adam, and this is a very highly, a widely held view, that we all sinned in the act of Adam, and that's why we experience death in our being. That's not the view Calvin takes, interestingly. He says, as though we perish through no fault of our own, but only because he had sinned for us. And that was a view that was in Calvin's day. It's a view that if you read a lot of commentaries, that's a view that's held today. But Paul distinctly affirms that sin extends to all who suffers its punishments, and this he afterwards fully declares. That is, that that we are sinners. And so it wasn't just Adam who sinned. Now he sinned and he brought us into this reality, the sphere of the world of sin. One way to think about it is, is Paul will use the example of being slaves in Egypt and going through the waters of the Red Sea as a sign of salvation. And he uses that slavery in Egypt to, to picture the human condition. Well, those children who were born into slavery they came into the sphere of slavery through their parents. And one way to think about it is, is that all human beings who participate in Adam, who participate in humanness, are in the sphere of sin by virtue of participating in a corrupted, just perverted nature. And that's exactly where Calvin's coming from on this. Uh, he says, Paul subsequently assigns a reason why all the posterity, meaning the children of Adam, are subject to the minion of death, and it is even this, because we have, he says, sinned. Like James Dunn, Calvin is saying that death extends to us because we all sin. But to sin in this case is to become corrupt and vicious, for the natural depravity which we bring from our mother's womb, though it brings not forth immediately its own fruits, that is, you know, when you're a baby, you don't see immediately the sinful nature, is yet sin before God. That is, that those sinful motions within us, that sin nature is already at odds with God. And that's why I like in our a very traditional, it's uh, taken from the Lutheran side of our church's background. It's in the Evangelical Book of Worship. We use that prayer of confession a lot, where it says we are by nature sinful and unclean. We're not saying 
that God made us that way, or that's how our essential nature, as the essential nature of humanness is, but our nature as it exists presently, you might say our existential nature, nature as it is, is by nature sinful and unclean from our mother's womb. And it is sin before God and deserves his vengeance. And this is that sin which they call original. That is, in our beings, um, we have this sin nature. And that sin nature, those tendencies, are themselves sin. They are themselves at odds with God, and we are born with them. In his, com uh, his theology books, Donald Blesch says, for the re reformers, concupiscence, which means concupiscence was a fancy word to say these inner wrong desires that we all have. Inner wrong desires is itself sin and not merely the tender of sin, the tender of sin. That is, we are by nature, Paul will say in the Ephesians, the objects of God's wrath. God is opposed to us. I, I think this is just so true that in our beings, remember in Luke's gospel, literally in the Greek, Jesus will say, if you being, and he uses the word being, if you being evil, give your children good gifts, how much more will your father give good gifts? Jesus says that in your being, you are evil. I think I brought with me um, a copy, and maybe I didn't, of the evangelical catechism. But it says, what is man's, what is our condition since the fall? And the answer is, since the fall, man is not prepared to do, or is in, uh, not prepared to do, but is inclined to evil. You being evil. Um, and so this is, um, this is what original sin is. Now, from his, uh, from his actual theology book, he says, original sin, therefore, seems to be a heredity, hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature diffused into all parts of the soul, which first makes us liable to God's wrath. That is, God is opposed to evil. And if Jesus said in Luke's gospel, you being in your very nature, as we say in our confession of sin, I am by nature sinful and unclean. Where does that unclean come from? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 14. And Paul will say that the believing parent, this is 1 Corinthians 7, 14, sanctifies the home and then Paul says, else your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Go and look at that. So he's, what he's implying is, is that if the parents weren't there, the children would be unclean and unholy. That that is our condition as, um, as human beings. And again, remember, Paul will use the deliverance from slavery through the Red Sea as a sign of what salvation looks like. And who was carried by their mothers and by their families out of slavery into freedom? The children of the families. This is the argument for uh, infant baptism. Um, one of the reasons I um, practice infant baptism is, I believe, as 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 14 says, and uh, 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 Louis Burkhoff, uh, well-known reformed theologian, this is one of the arguments he'll make a lot. And my view of infant baptism is more reformed than it is Lutheran. I believe in what's called household baptism. That is, often when if someone was converted in the book of Acts, the whole household would be baptized. Now, it doesn't say infants. You can't, you can't find that there. And then Paul will say he baptized the household of Stephanus or Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 1. But if the children of believers in 1 Corinthians 7 are clean and holy, what is the sign and the seal of being made clean and holy? It's being baptized. So I have, I have um, feel very comfortable baptizing the children of believers because the Bible says they're clean and holy. But I'm making my argument here to say that Paul assumes that they, they're not by nature that way that this is something that's happening because of the sanctifying presence of God in that home through the believing person who has God in their lives. That believing... Now, I would baptize the children of who are being 
raised by grandparents, if they're believing grandparents and they're very active in that child's life, because that presence is sanctifying. And in the ancient world, there was a lot more of a sense of solidarity as a group. And there is a lot of that in this idea that in Adam's sin, he affected everybody else. And we are drawn into his situation of sin, the sphere of sin. Like if you were born into Egypt, you were born a, a, a Hebrew, you were born into the sphere of slavery. And you had there was nothing you did about it. You were just born into that sphere of slavery. And the picture of the Bible is, is that all human beings from the get-go are born into the sphere of sin. And they have this corrupted nature. Uh, so this is what Calvin goes on to say. Original sin, therefore, seems to be a heredity, hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature, diffused into all parts of the soul, which first makes us liable to God's wrath. This sounds just like his commentaries. Then also brings forth in us those works which Scripture calls works of the flesh. Well, the flesh is that sinful nature. And that is properly what Paul calls sin. The works that come forth from it, such as adulteries, fornications, thefts, hatreds, murders, carousing, the fruits of sin. Well, that's that's our sin nature. Um, and so I um, I believe this is why then we are guilty, or and we are in, at, at odds with God, because um, because. We ourselves are sinners in our being. You being evil, Jesus says. I'm really emphasizing the negative part. I got to get to the positive before time is gone because that's really the, the emphasis here. Um, I like what he says. Since it is said that we became subject to God's judgment through Adam's sin, we are to understand it not as if we, guiltless and undeserving, bore the guilt of his offense. Sometimes it's original sins presented that way. It's like somehow, well, you know, he 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 made the choice for everybody else, and we we have no participation in that sin. He just did it separate from us. But uh, what Calvin says is this: nor no um, since we through his transgression, okay, have become entangled in. He says that not only has punishment fallen on us from from Adam, but a contagion imparted by him resides in us which justly deserves punishment. For this reason, Augustine, though he often calls sin on others to show more clearly that it is distributed among us through propagation, nevertheless declares at the same time that it is peculiar to each. That is, we are a part of the mass known as Adam, humanity, and we participate in the broken condition. And here's the thing, is this is the state of human beings and an important thing when we're thinking about a country like the United States of America, if you if you if you're going to do something, you got to take keep, keep in uh, you're going to form a government. You got to make sure you keep in mind this tendency of human nature that everyone should be able to see that human nature uh, doesn't change, and it takes a lot of work to to maintain a kind of order and peace. That this is a great achievement that we've. Uh, we've been able to accomplish in this country and it needs to be maintained and uh, striven for because human beings are the same as they were 200 years ago and uh, we need to we need to all I'm saying is I just cannot believe I don't want to get too political but if you're going to defund the police some of the mentality there is is like oh, you got you better be sure you got something that is doing that the same is, is taking into account there's going to be crime and things because human nature is what it is. And we need to have some structure there that is working to maintain order and peace, you know. And so, uh, and again, I, I don't know all the details of what they're working out in Minneapolis or, you know, where these other places. I, I, so I, I don't want to misspeak. But we got we to gotta keep in mind we all participate. None of us is out of Adam. We are in Adam. And um, so he says, verse 13, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam 
to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. That is, without the Mosaic law, without the Ten Commandments, people were not, they did not have a written external law out here that they knew they were breaking. Now, Paul has said earlier that they have it written in their heart, but it's all clouded and it's distorted. But he said, even though they weren't breaking a known outside of themselves law in the way that Adam did, they were experiencing death. And this is where Calvin and then another guy, uh, Robert Gundry, in his commentary point out, good to have you with us, Johnny, that, um, that this shows that, that the sinful tendency itself in us is what's working death in us because it, it's caused us to be at odds with God. And we experience ourselves as guilty and we experience ourselves. This is this the sad place that we live in. We live in this place as human beings of, of knowing ourselves to be sinners. Again, this is the commentary by Franzman and he describes this human condition so well in his commentary. He's speaking about what is death uh, when he says it's working death in us, you know, that we die in Adam. He says, well, Adam did not drop dead when he had taken the faithful step and death entered the world. And so, although Adam ultimately died, he's, uh, uh, Paul will speak a little bit later of the reign of death and of death, the reign of sin and death. This takes us closer to his meaning. Death is not only the end of life, but the opposite of life in the full sense of the word life. And again, I'm thinking because it's um, Sunday is the Fourth of July weekend of you know having my sermon include elements of thinking about our country and what our country is about. And one of these things is we say that our country is about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And happiness, as Jefferson was using it there, as I showed a few uh, Fourth of Julys ago, had to go back to this word in the Greek eudaimonia, which means, which was like how Aristotle and the Scholastics would then use it of a life lived right, the well-lived life. And death for Paul here is not just, the reign of death is not just that people are dying physically, which that, of course, is a terrible thing, but that's the culmination of a life that's, that's dying, that's not being lived fully and rightly. And that's what sin does. Sin, it stultifies life. It makes life small. It, it, it empty, it, and so he's saying death does that. Um, I like, I quote, I highlighted this as Martin Franzman, uh, his book, uh, Concordia Publishing House Publishing. Death means that men are born into lives of desperation and die deaths of desperation. Man cannot fear, love, and trust his God. He must suppress the truth of God because he sees in God the death dealer. Remember we said before, G I mean, though the eye of sinful man, the glory of God can't see, God is against me. I feel this guilt. This is that original sin. I feel my, for my very being is not right with God. Man's avarice and his worrying are tokens of the reign of death. Avarice means your greed and your worrying. Why? Because you're trying to you're trying to bolster yourself up through stuff. And uh, he must, in his desperation, get what he can and have while he can. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Man's wild, ungovernable sex impulse is another mark of his desperation, his protest against the fact that his life is a dying life. Very well-known book in the 70s was The Denial of Death by a psychiatrist, Ernst Becker. And a lot of theologians picked up on this where he was saying that so much of, of human motivation is this underlying awareness of our dying. and. Um, a man's desire for acceptance and prestige, his self-seeking ambition are part of man's desperate quest for an antidote to death. The death of man as man's doom means that man lives at a dying rate as he moves towards the time when death shuts up the story of his days. Um, all men after Adam sinned and thus repeated and confirmed in their own lives the act and doom of Adam. Um, so I, I really... Uh, I, I fully believe this interpretation. Um, I wanted to get to the 
the commentary that Alan gave me. He's got some good quotes in here. What they do is they take the different reformers and take their quotes about this passage. And uh, speaking in the same way about this, Martin Luther says, As the ancient Holy Father so correctly said, this original sin is the very tinder of sin, the law of the flesh, the law of the members, the weakness of our nature, the tyrant, the original sickness. For it is like a sick man whose mortal illness is not only the loss of health of one of his members, but it is, in addition to the lack of health in his members, the weakness of all his senses and powers, culminating even in his disdain for those things which are healthful and in his desire for those things which make him sick. That human beings desire things that make them sick. And isn't that strange, but true, that we go after these things that actually are poisoning our bodies, poisoning our minds, poisoning our relationships, poisoning our families. All this is a sign of our, our sin nature, this thing the Bible calls the flesh. I'm aware now that we got to get to the good news because we spent a lot of time on this bad news. I've been doing a lot of study on this because it's such a key passage. Verse 15. But the gift, is not like the trespass. The trespass was when Adam, Adam, brought us into the sphere of slavery. And like the people in Egypt, we were all born into the sphere of sin. For if the many, now this is a Hebrew way of speaking about all. Many means all. For if the many died by the trespass, there's not like many humans that are part of this situation. It's all humans. Of this one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? That is, because Adam is humanity, and we are in Adam, we are in the human condition, and Adam is the original human, we all participate. Because Jesus is a man, and he took our humanity, now our humanity participates in his rightness and it flows to all human beings all human being now this doesn't mean universal salvation because he's going to say that that it has to be received by faith but it is objectively true this is controversial as well but i believe this teaching was called objective reconciliation this is a particular Lutheran teaching, especially, versus reform. Objective meaning that objectively, because Jesus took on our humanity, now our humanity has been redeemed it, for all people. And because it's for all people, then we know it's for us. This is the really good news. And this is why Paul was stirred up by saying, therefore, just as sin. See, he wasn't wanting to make this whole thing about sin because that's not his interest. His interest is the love of God. His interest is the face of God, not just what people have been seeing in the back of God, that he's angry with me and that I'm a sinner. He wants them to see the beauty of God, the glory of God, that God took on our humanity and he redeemed it and he saved us. Um, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace Overflowed in memory, nor can the gift, verse 16, be compared with the result of one man's sin. They're not even, he can't even compare it because it's just so much better. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. The judgment is we were all put into the sphere of sin. And so in that way, Adam's sin does stand for us. His decision, the decision of the, of the first humans, put us all into the sphere of sin. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification, being put in the right with God. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, death has been reigning in this world. We just talked about how terrible it is. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace? And see, that's the difference here. The grace is there and it's for everybody. And there's more than enough for everybody. But subjective, meaning personally received reconciliation, receives the objective thing that happened. The objective thing that happened is, is that Jesus took our humanity and redeemed it. We receive it as a gift and say, I believe you, Lord. You took it on. You took my, you took my desperate situation on yourself. 
you took my my condemnation upon yourself and you have redeemed my humanness and all human nature and i am saved through you um consequently just as one trespass is renounced so also the one righteous act resulted in the justification and life for all people see and i really believe that means all people if you read this the many and the all again this doesn't mean universal salvation that all will be saved but i do believe personally in universal atonement jesus died for the all people that that deviates from the standard reformed view of of that and i understand the arguments for that but i i personally don't find them convincing um so also through the obedience of one man the many will be of uh, will be made righteous uh, so here's the thing is for paul is is he's wanting us to see that that what has happened in jesus it, he's using the example of adam to show us this glorious truth that the work has been finished you know when jesus said it is finished he accomplished in that one act of a, of a righteous life that bears the sins of the world and bears the wrath of God and the judgment of God. It's a full and complete salvation for all people in the same way all humanity participates in Adam, participates in our, our sinful nature. So all humanity has been, in principle, redeemed, forgiven, is, is right with God. And what we're calling people to do is to believe it, to believe it, to believe God forgave me. He forgave my sin in Jesus' name, um, as we sing. And, and it's when you believe that and you, you know it, that's the truth about God. The truth about God is, is not that wrath I've been feeling though that is a truth about God, but it's not the truth about God, and it's not the primary truth. The primary truth about God is God is love, and he's borne our sin. Um, and in him we are forgiven when we receive it, when we believe it, and we live from it. And that's what it means to live as a believer. I remember one time reading Martin Luther, and he was discussing what's the difference between Peter and Judas, you know, why Peter, who denied Jesus three times, goes on and he's a, a vibrant living Christian and Judas doesn't. And Luther's answer was Peter believed the promise because in Jesus Christ, Judas was forgiven. Judas was as a part of the human condition. He was a part of the human situation, but he failed to believe as far as we can tell failed to believe that he was included. And so he never experienced that peace. But if you really read this passage and you meditate on it and you think about it, it will cause you to recognize, I'm, I'm included. I'm forgiven. Whatever it is I'm done, I'm included because I'm a part of human nature. Jesus took human nature and he redeemed it. Just like Adam. Amen. Connie. Just like, so what he's really saying is just like the trespass, just like Adam, as we're wrapping this up, as you see in Adam, all are apart. So in Jesus, all are apart. And that includes you. That's his whole point here, is to magnify all. And, and so you are included. Receive it and live from the fact that you're not excluded. If you were in Adam, if you are in the human condition in the same way you are in Jesus and receive it and believe it and it will become a living reality in your life. Well, I look forward to continuing to work on this and flesh it out as we're thinking about what it means um, to live a life full of life, liberty and the pursuit of the right life and, and uh, what it means and how to do that in the light of Christ for, for Sunday's sermon. I want to end with a quick prayer. Father, we thank you for this truth. It's a hard truth, and we spent a lot of time talking about this strange doctrine, but I think if we examine our own lives, we recognize that we have a sinful nature that is, uh, that is 
being evil. We are being evil in our being. Not that everything about us is evil, but we're all this mixture of good and bad, imperfections. And we felt deeply uh, the being at odds with you. Uh, thank you that we can see in Jesus Christ that you're not at odds with us in him, that you have redeemed us, you've forgiven us, you've given us full salvation in him. And may that set us free to really live for you and to rest assured, to rest assured that by an act you made us right. It's not through any kind of action we can accomplish, through the act of the man Jesus, just like through the act of the man Adam, people were brought into the sphere of death and sin and sinful nature and born into slavery to that. So through the act of the man Jesus, we were made right. And that act was accomplished in time and space. And we rest our lives in the finished work of Jesus. We do not look at our own works. We do not trust in our own goodness and our own ability. We rest that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We rejoice in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And uh, hope to see you in person, if you can come, or uh, on Facebook Live Sunday as we continue to think about and, and rejoice in this great good news.